Energy Media readers, I've got a terrific uh, treat for you today. We are going to be talking to Chris Nelder, who is the uh, podcast host of the Energy Transition Show, my favorite podcast, and a little bit of a rock star in the Energy Transition Show, and also an analyst for the Rocky Mountain Institute. So, Chris, welcome to the interview. Thanks very much, Mark. I'm good to be here. Now, I'm really excited about this because I've listened to your, uh, your podcast for the last uh, couple of years, and uh, you get into some really, really interesting discussions with your guests. Some of them are really highly technical. But today, what we're going to be talking about is the fact that the energy transition, it's uh, self-sustaining. The pump has been primed. It no longer needs to be primed by policy, by government, or at least not, as, not nearly as much. And what is your take on that particular uh, point? I mean, yeah, uh, you know, the old, uh, what was it a Hemingway line, I think, about how one of his characters went broke, you know, slowly at first and then all at once. Um, I think that kind of applies to the energy transition. There have been obviously decades of work that have gone into, you know, taking technologies like solar and wind that, uh, didn't really work hardly at all in the 60s and then gradually refining and improving them until they became uh, truly commercially viable and now they've gotten to the point where they're the cheapest resources around and they're pushing fossil fuels off the grid for example. Um, but that same thing is true in many different technologies, right? That's true for electric cars. The electric cars we had based on lead acid batteries in the 70s were, you know, they were kind of a joke. They were glorified golf carts. If you really had to have one, you could. Um, but then all you have to do is look at the history of, uh, you know, recounted and who killed the electric car to know what happened to that. Uh, but now uh, we're in a different world uh, with um, very sophisticated cars that are superior in every way to an internal combustion vehicle um, and uh, are rapidly becoming more affordable than internal combustion vehicles. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of different evolutions that took place over decades that led up to this point, uh, but now uh, they're, you know, achieving commercial success on their own. And then once you've hit that tipping point, it's really, there's really no way to, you know, put the genie back in the bottle. Uh, you've, you've passed the tipping point, you stay past it. Now, that's a really interesting point because the economic cost per unit of, say, power produced, uh, if you look at the levelized cost of energy estimates that are produced by the Lazard, for instance, what you find is that wind is down around, onshore wind is down around $28 a megawatt hour, uh, solar is at $32 a megawatt hour, and gas and new gas and coal uh, are quite a bit higher than that. And so what we've really, what it seems like is that we've not only got to the point where it's cheaper, but it's higher value because now you, you don't have particulate in the air from coal, you don't have, you have uh, CO2 emissions uh, issues that you're mitigating. And it's this idea, I think, uh, for me, of the new technologies providing a higher value. So economic, lower economic costs plus other externalities or other uh, benefits that are provided, that's when you hit the inflection point and you really zoom up that S-curve of adoption. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would say so. You know, there's, there's sort of a classic uh, S-curve, as you were saying, um, that technology typically follows. And, you know, kind of to my earlier point, it takes those decades of development to get to a certain point. And then um, the typical thing is once you get to sort of 1% or 2% market penetration uh, with any new technology, then all of a sudden it can really start to rapidly be adopted. Um, so I think that's the kind of thing that we're starting to see now in, in uh, renewables, uh, but again, also electric vehicles. You know, electric vehicles just got to the you know two percent market share um, last year in the U.S. Uh, so now we can really expect there to be a, a more rapid adoption starting to take place. Right, and one of the arguments that's often made in in Canada, because we're you know a little behind on the energy transition uh, track. Is, is that uh, uh, climate policy is the thing that is driving the energy transition. And you can kind of understand why people think this, because the International Energy Agency, for instance, anytime that it talks about the energy transition, it does it through the lens of climate change and climate policy. So 
you know, you can understand why some people get that impression. But from my point of view, the energy transition is self-sustaining and climate policy is like an accelerator pedal in a car. You want it to go faster, you press the, the policy pedal harder. And, it, and as governments enact more stringent climate policies like carbon pricing and so on, we, that should be another thing that, it, that serves to accelerate the transition. What's your take? Yeah, I would agree. I think, I think policy is particularly useful when you're trying to get a new technology to the point where it's commercially competitive on its own merits um, or where it's able to compete on a level basis with the incumbents. Um, of course, there's a lot of ways to distort that in the energy markets. Uh, pretty much every kind of participant in the energy markets um, is distorted in one way or another or subsidized in one way or another. I mean, we still subsidize oil and gas to an absurd degree, and that's an industry that's over a century old. I mean, you have to ask yourself, why are we continuing to subsidize these things if they can't compete, you know, stand on their own two feet and compete. Um, so uh, policy is, is a difficult question in terms of when do you need it and, and when can you withdraw it? But I think we're about at the point now where actually renewables could have their incentives withdrawn, where you would not need policy in order to ensure that they continue to gain market share. Um, even against incumbents that are still getting incentivized, that are still getting policy support. Um, but if you have something like a carbon tax or some other climate policy, um, in the U.S. we use portfolio standards, example, for example, in a lot of states uh, to make sure that there's a certain amount of renewables on the grid. Um, those kinds of things can, as you say, act as an accelerator. Um, the... Um we were talking on a recent podcast, I think it was two or three podcasts ago, that uh, Colorado recently had a, an auction for a power auction, and the they were looking for power in around the 3.7, 3.8 cents per kilowatt hour, which in and of itself is, is uh, quite competitive, but it also included storage, and that seems to be a real game breaker here. Yeah, a lot of the new utility scale solar plants, but also increasingly wind, are now coming with uh, some storage component uh, as a part of the system. Um, and, you know, it's kind of interesting, you don't actually need to have co-located storage with a wind farm or with a solar farm in order for it to act like storage for those things. They don't need to be physically located next to each other, but they usually are because of the way that the tax credits are calculated. Uh, if it's part of a single package, you can get um, some tax credit for the storage component. Uh, but putting that aside, um, yes, uh, wind and solar utility scale systems are increasingly coming with storage bundled in. Um, and even with the storage component bundled in, they're still cheaper than uh, the natural gas or, or coal equivalents. And, and I also wanted to make a, a point to you know, the Lazard data that you presented at first, which is great as far as that goes. The levelized cost of energy data that they publish is widely used in the industry. But I just want to point out that what they're pointing out there are basically average costs across an entire industry. Um, and you know, that's like saying, well, what's the average price of a home in Canada? Right. Well, you could get that number, but is that going to tell you what your house is worth? Absolutely not. Um, so you can get um, a levelized cost of energy out of that data for, you know, 25 bucks for, for solar or, or, you know, whatever it is. But in reality, we're seeing uh, wind and solar projects um, without storage coming in below two cents a kilowatt hour uh, in many places in the, in the world right now including the US and Canada. And, and with storage, we're seeing them in the sort of, you know, three cent to four cent range. So yeah, once you've done that, now you have a resource that's dispatchable, essentially, even when the wind dies down or the sun goes down, um, which makes it a little more comparable maybe to some of the other incumbents that they're displacing. Now, one of the amazing things about this, of course, is that cost curves for both renewables and batteries are still bending down. So we're not finished yet with cost reductions. And I want to give you 
uh, a little example from my own experience. So two years ago, uh, well, let's say 2017, so almost three years ago, we were talking, uh, I was talking about to uh, a source and they were buying batteries at $195 a kilowatt hour. And in 2018, they were buying batteries at $135 a kilowatt hour. And now we hear that maybe Volkswagen has got that price down to $100 a kilowatt hour through manufacturing efficiencies. And your colleague, you have a couple of colleagues, including uh, Maddie Tyson at the Rocky Mountain Institute, who have just released this study showing that by 2030, that could be $50 a kilowatt hour, which is essentially seven or eight years ahead of when every, anybody thought that this would happen. That's really quite an astonishing cost reduction. Yeah, it is. Um, and in fact, the cost reductions that we've seen just in the last year or two are far outpacing the expectations that we had just like four years ago, right? I mean, all this stuff is accelerating um, and coming down in cost faster than anyone really projected. Um, and a lot of that is due to things that you really can't predict. I mean, we knew whatever it was four or five years ago uh, when Elon Musk announced that he was going to build this gigafactory uh, near uh, Reno, Nevada, that we were going to see some significant cost reductions, at least for Tesla's supply chain and battery costs. What we could not have predicted at that time was that there was going to be a whole lot of gigafactories built in countries all over the world. Um, all of which would continue to drive costs down more broadly across the industry. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I was shocked to see uh, battery prices, you know, uh, below uh, $150 a kilowatt hour two years ago, pushing $100 already. Um, and I think um, even that expectation of hitting $50 by 2030 is, is probably on the conservative side. Now, we've talked a lot about the continuing decline in costs and how this is going to accelerate technology adoption. But just as there are accelerators to adoption, there are also constraints. And we often overlook those. Uh, if from your point of view, what are some of the constraints to adoption that at least have the potential to put the brakes on this process uh, on adoption just even a little bit? Adoption of anything in particular, or uh, let's say renewables and uh, batteries and electric vehicles, just as examples. Yeah. Um, oddly enough, policy is oftentimes the the big obstacle right now. The incumbents are uh, not going to go gentle into that good night, and they have uh, started to work every lever at their disposal. Uh, the legislators that they own. Uh, the various other policy mechanisms that they can dream up. Um, in the U.S., you know, there's a lot of um, activity happening now at the federal regulatory level where they're trying to find new ways to put a thumb on the scale in favor of the incumbents and stop the encroachment of renewables onto the grid. Um, there's similar things happening with electric vehicles right now. I mean, they're only... Um, 1% of the vehicles on the road, you know, in the U.S., 2% of market share. And uh, guess what? Everybody thinks, uh, all the legislators who uh, listen to the fossil fuel industry or who are paid by the fossil fuel industry, guess what they think the solution to declining road tax revenue is? Get it from the EVs, right? Never mind the 98% of the internal combustion vehicles that are on the road who uh, the revenue from which through gas taxes has been inadequate for years and years and years now. I mean, we've been trying to find various ways to plug budget holes um, in our road maintenance budgets long before EVs came around. Uh, but now that EVs have come around, well, let's, let's stick them with the high fees uh, to try to come up with more revenue because they're not buying gasoline. Um, it's just silly stuff like that, that, from a policy standpoint, makes absolutely no sense, but it's all about protecting the interests of the incumbents and um, the legislators uh, that, that they own. So Chris, let's talk for a moment about a different uh, policy environment, and I'm thinking primarily here of uh, municipal bylaws. So for instance, uh, we were, uh, until recently, we lived on the lower mainland of British Columbia. It's uh, uh, highly populated and very dense, lots of 
condo buildings that have parkades, for instance. These buildings were built at a time when they didn't, the wiring, the electrical infrastructure wasn't built to handle electric vehicle chargers. And so this has been an impediment to provide building out that infrastructure, which then in turn supports the adoption of electric vehicles. Are, are you seeing in uh, the United States, are you seeing a concerted movement to overcome that policy barrier? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, and again, it's one of those things that kind of took a while to get some momentum going, but now there's definitely momentum on any number of fronts. Um, on the legislative level, we now have a number of uh, states where they're working on trying to make sure, for example, that new buildings are EV ready. So they're updating building codes to make sure that there's adequate power supply to the building to support EV charging and that their places where the EV charges would be located are, are wired for it when, right from the beginning, right from the construction of the building. Um, there are other ways that we're starting to, for example, modify uh, requirements around parking uh, such that um, an EV charging station could use an existing parking space rather than having to build a new one. Uh, we're starting to find um, a number of ways that uh, uh, incentives are being designed to encourage um, multi-unit dwellings to build that charging infrastructure uh, one way or another for their tenants and or to locate high-speed charging stations near apartment buildings and that kind of thing so that those residents can have them uh, so that it's so that EV ownership is not just restricted to people with single-family homes in a garage where they can charge overnight. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of different levels on which uh, that is starting to evolve and we're getting new incentives in place, new building and planning codes. Um, and uh, you know, my, my team at Rocky Mountain Institute, um, working on the electric vehicle space, uh, we're all about getting charging infrastructure built for um, all sorts of applications, not just multi-unit dwellings, but um, workplaces and just publicly accessible charging uh, everywhere, um, as well as fleets and so on. And there's, there's a whole lot of work that needs to be done on the utility side to encourage that. Um, and, uh, you know, a, a big part of what I do is run around and talk to regulatory commissions about why we need to have this uh, investment in charging infrastructure, especially by the utilities. And then how do we make sure that we're creating a good business case for building out these networks and owning and operating them? Uh, because in many cases today, um, there really isn't a good business case for doing it. The, the costs are, are just much too high. Um, and a lot of that can be fixed um, at the regulatory level just by changing the way that utility tariffs are designed. You know, we're still gonna get we're still going to make sure the utility gets adequate cost recovery, but we're going to uh, do it in a different way such that it doesn't kill the business case for the charging stations in the meantime. Let's pull back to the 35,000 foot level for a moment, because this is a, an issue that I write about quite a bit on energy media, and that is the requirement for, for Canada, but particularly hydrocarbon oriented provinces like Alberta, to begin that pivot to the low carbon future. And one of the reasons why is because every time there's a significant economic uh, structural change, a transformation, so we think of maybe uh, you know, the rapid adoption of automobiles in the 1920s, uh, there are winners and losers in, that, in, that, in those industries. And so yes, the United States you know, won in the 20s and became a, a manufacture, automobile manufacturing powerhouse. Uh, but uh, some European countries lost out in, in that race. And so the point I'm getting at is, it, is if policymakers, uh, business leaders, and others don't take advantage now and, take adva and seize opportunities as they're presented, getting left behind in this transformation, the energy transition, has real economic costs, and that can lead back to a, you know, a decline in lifestyles, all that sort of thing. What's your, what's your take? Yeah, well, I mean, um, for a very recent indication of what that's all about, just take a look at some of the pronouncements that have come out of, you know, some of the big asset uh, managers like BlackRock, for instance, recently saying, you know what, we don't really want to invest in, in fossil fuel projects anymore. 
We don't want to have our money invested in companies that are exposed to the fossil fuel sector anymore. Uh, we think those are money losing endeavors. We think that the risk of stranded assets is just getting greater every year. Uh, and we prefer not to be exposed to that stuff. We want to be invested in the, in the disruptors on the energy transition side. Um, so the, the asset management community, I think around the world has been uh, telegraphing this message very clearly and unambiguously um, and in the last couple months in particular quite stridently as well like you have to really have your fingers planted deeply in your ears not to hear what they're trying to tell you um, but you know there's also the companies on the incumbency side of this who again uh, may prefer to fight for what's left of their market share than to uh, cannibalize their own businesses and embrace the transition. I think nowhere is that truer than with the oil and gas companies um, uh, and, and the coal mining companies, of course, as well. They're in a very tough spot. Um, and, you know, and, and what's interesting to me about this is um, oh, about 15 years ago, um, when I was actually in the solar industry, all of the major oil companies had significant um, you know, business units that were starting up to explore energy transition solutions, right? They all, like BP made some of the nice solar mo nicest solar modules in the world. Uh, Shell had a big um, business unit that was all about various kinds of wind and solar and grid type solutions and so on. Um, all, the, all the oil majors were doing this. And then they all pulled back and they all sold off those transition um, oriented business units and went back to their oil and gas business. And um, apparently a lot of that uh, sounds like had to do with cultural issues within the companies. So um, it's not really clear to me which of those are actually going to be able to once again attempt to reinvent themselves and embrace the transition. Well, given that I write about uh, oil and gas culture a lot and which uh, it's a sister, the um, uh, politics, energy politics. I have a my here's my take on that, Chris. Uh, culture is a very, very difficult thing to change, and the uh, Shell and BP and X, well, maybe Exxon, but there's a lot of those big majors that at least 15 years ago they were thinking about it. They accepted the science behind climate change. They could see the long-term trends beginning, and even if it was an aborted attempt to get on board with the energy transition, the fact that they did that had a big positive impact on their, uh, on their culture and on their, their management, their leadership, because now some of those people that 15 years ago were a little younger, getting established, they're now managers and they're executives and they're, and they're leaders and they're, they're you know, you look at Shell and, and some of the major uh, changes it's making. In Canada, you don't see that. You see that maybe in some of the big companies, but down at the lower level, it is business as usual and cotton batting in the ear. In the ear, they don't want to hear anything. So I, I, I get it, and uh, uh, I hope in a way that the majors do manage to make the turn because they have capital, they have technology, they have project management expertise, they have a lot of things that could be beneficial to the energy transition down the road. What's your take? Well, I mean, I, I, I hope that's true. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, um, if you're in, deeply embedded, for example, in the, in the oil sands industry, um, you have a rational decision that, hopefully rational decision that you have to make, right? Um, is, my, is the risk of embracing the transition in some level, diversifying my business or whatever that means to, to you, uh, is that risk worth taking relative to just fighting for what I've got, uh, for just trying to hang on to my place in the market as an oil sands producer? Um, and I think uh, for many of them, they, they don't understand the opportunity on the transition side. And so, it looks like all risk and no opportunity or no value to them. Um, and they do understand very well what the risk is of giving up what they've got on the, on the oil production side. So um, 
I think a big part of what needs to be done here is for uh, to educate these people and also to embed in their culture a deeper and a more current understanding of where the opportunity is in energy transition and, and how they can be a part of it. Um, how they can, you know, to again, to revive talking points from 15 years ago, how they can restructure themselves to be energy companies, not just oil companies or whatever the case may be. Because you're right, they do have expertise. They've got balance sheets and, and all sorts of stuff. I mean, one of the greatest things that the oil industry that operates in offshore, for example, can do right now is to, you know, leverage their technology for offshore wind. Um, and there's, there's a few that are doing that, but we could do it with a whole lot more of it. I, I interviewed uh, Professor David Murphy, uh, who's written a, a textbook about energy transition. I was introduced to, to David on your podcast, actually. Mm -hmm. And so you know him well. And yeah. one of the things that we discussed was the role that educating students about the energy transition the role that that then plays as they go out into the workplace and they get themselves established as professionals and they might work in the regulatory uh, level or they might work in private industry or maybe even in a policy. But you've got now a cadre of people who are, who are uh, trained, as it were. And I, what I, don't, I don't see that in Canada. And the discussions around the energy transition in Canada are the ones that you were having in the United States 10, 12 years ago, 15 years ago. Yeah. And that puts our country and some of our key provinces like Alberta way, way behind the eight ball. And when I interview American experts like you, because I get a, a breadth of vision and a breadth of technical expertise that is very difficult to find in Canada. And I don't know what you know about Canada or how many uh, you know, colleagues and associates you have up there, but do you think that, that my take is a fair one? I do. Um, you know, I have a Canadian birth certificate. Uh, my parents are both uh, Canadian by birth. I, I uh, do pay attention to what's happening in Canada, and uh, it does concern me that um, the fossil fuel incumbency and its political power um, has been quite successful in um, pushing back any progress on energy transition um, and making sure that Canada remains wedded to its fossil fuel resources. Um, both economically and, and politically. Uh, that's very unfortunate. I mean, I, at the same time, you know, I feel the same way you do when I look at Netherlands and Germany and, you know, uh, Norway and so on. Uh, in many ways, uh, these are places that had their own um, incumbencies to deal with on the fossil fuel side, you know. Uh, Germany's automakers and Netherlands' uh, uh, North Sea, uh, you know, gas field. Um, uh, Norway's offshore uh, oil and gas resources and so on. But for various reasons, they were able to politically develop um, real policy momentum and focus toward the energy transition and, and leverage the resources of, you know, the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund. All that money came from oil and gas production, right? And it's all being invested now in renewables and it's all being removed from uh, or divested of uh, fossil fuel interest, because that's the rational thing to do if you're a money manager, let alone where the money came from. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's unfortunate that you always have to have this political um, inertia to overcome. Um, and, you know, as the old uh, thing with Sinclair Lewis line goes, it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. Uh, but uh, I do think that eventually prices speak for themselves. Um, and even in a place like Canada where you have sort of this drag on you from the oil and gas industry, you know, eventually just being able to make electricity for a fraction of the cost with renewables starts to speak for itself. Final question, Chris. I mean, this has been a fascinating discussion. I look forward to more in the future. But this is a so final question. Uh, I've been saying for a while now that the 2020s are going to be an amazing decade. They're going to be like the dot-com boom in the 1990s. Rapid change, lots of capital investment in new industries and new infrastructure. Uh, do you share that view? Oh, absolutely. Um, again, I think <clears throat> energy transition was building up 
long, slow decades of building up uh, to a point where it's about ready to hit that inflection point and get to that rapid adoption part of the S-curve. Um, and we're seeing that point being hit now um, in all sorts of domains. It's in the power sector, it's in the electric vehicle sector, it's in you know, heat pumps uh, in the buildings sector, it's in, um, it's in all sorts of different domains, and all of that stuff starts to have a certain synergy after a while. Um, we just recently did a, a show with uh, Dr. Christopher Clack on the podcast where we uh, talked about his studies on Colorado and Minnesota. And one of the interesting things that came out of that was the more electric vehicles and heat pumps that you add to the grid, the more those two technologies, heat pumps and, and electric vehicles, start to act synergistically to bring down grid power prices across the board um, and to make heating and mobility cheaper. So there's a kind of virtuous cycle that starts to kick in, but it's even more pronounced when you have both heat pumps and electric vehicles acting together than if it was just one or the other. Um, and part of that has to do with when they demand power and how grid power balancing and so on is done. But you see this kind of thing happening in multiple domains now. So I, I do think that we're going to see a rapid acceleration of energy transition activity and solutions uh, this decade that's going to, you know, just astonish everyone, really. Chris Nelder, thank you very much for this. Really appreciate it. Enjoyed the discussion, and we'll look forward to uh, more in the future. My pleasure, Markham. Thank you very much for having me on.